It's all about having the key insights, following the leaders of the crypto industry and background stories on blockchain technology trends to keep you one step ahead. Monty Metzger, CEO of LCX.com, keeps you up to speed with what's moving global crypto markets and gives you the latest insights about LCX's platform and ecosystem. This is LCX Insights Live. Welcome to LCX Insights Live. It's my pleasure to welcome you on this Sunday afternoon European time. It's the 16th May 2021 and we have a very special LCX Insights Live today. In our live shows, I'm engaging with the world's top blockchain project, entrepreneurs, investors and pioneers in crypto and blockchain in honest conversations meant to challenge traditional ways of thinking. My name is Monty Metzger, and I'm founder and CEO at LCX. LCX is a regulated fintech company that focuses on digital asset trading, compliant token offerings, and tokenization. LCX received eight blockchain-related approvals by the Liechtenstein regulator more than any other company in the country. Liechtenstein itself is a country next to Switzerland and Austria, landlocked. Uh, and in the heart of Europe, and has received a AAA country rating from Standard & Poor's. So that's the highest rating a country can get, very high reputation. Liechtenstein has introduced the most forward-thinking legal framework for cryptocurrencies and blockchain companies, providing legal clarity and security for our users. So what had been happening recently at LCX? First, uh, we ended the Uniswap liquidity program and distributed the funds to all qualified users. Second, um, we launched two more tr Euro trading pairs, Bitcoin against Euro, Ethereum against Euro. And uh, before that, as you all know, we launched LCX token against Euro as a trading pair. And now third, this week, LCX reached another milestone because we are finally fully listed at CoinMarketCap with a fully tracked listing. This means we are now reporting all real-time data to CoinMarketCap, fully transparent and uh, being fully tracked now against all the other spot exchanges over there. At LCX Insights, we are inviting leading personalities, key partners of LCX and founders or senior management of blockchain projects listed at LCX Exchange. Today's show, the title is Beyond Trading, Crypto Use Cases with Origin Protocol. So today's guest leads the business development of Origin Protocol. Origin has been innovating on both DeFi and NFTs and their token OGN is trading on Coinbase, Binance, Hubi and LCX Exchange. He joined the team back in 2017 and has been fully immersed in crypto since before then. He studied math at Berkeley and is originally from San Francisco, but now lives in the heart of Asia. Please welcome Mr. Coleman Mahra. Let's get him in into the show. Hi. Hi, Coleman. How are you? Hey. I'm good. It's great to be here with you. Excellent. Yeah. Let's start right in. The audience wants to know what is Origin Protocol? Can you explain that in a couple of sentences? Sure. So um, there are two main, uh, I guess, verticals that Origin is focused on, and you mentioned them earlier. The first is NFTs, and the second is DeFi. Um, so, you know, those are two very, very hot uh, industries in crypto right now. Um, with NFTs, we've done a number of high profile NFT drops with different musical artists, Grammy nominated, Grammy winning artists. Uh, we've done a uh, drop with Jake Paul, like a mega influencer. Uh, we've got a bunch of other celebrities and high profile artists and musicians lined up for our NFT uh, drops. And on the DeFi side, uh, we've, we've got a product called Origin Dollar, which aggregates all the best DeFi yields and uh, gives you passive exposure to that. So you don't have to manually yield farm yourself. You get all the best yields from DeFi just by holding Origin Dollar. So those are our two main products and what we've been up to in the space. Mm -hmm. And now if you look at Origin Protocol, it's um, the, the protocol is at its core. What does it mean um, 
if you compare it to these actual drops and NFTs, what's the underlying technology there we are talking about? So the underlying technology is different uh, for those two products. Uh, Origin Dollar is kind of its own separate thing. It's it's based on smart contracts built on Ethereum. Uh, everything is decentralized, and we're moving towards decentralized governance. Um, so that's one separate uh, product that's not uh, directly technically related to uh, the NFT launchpad, as we call it. The NFT launchpad is uh, a little bit more centralized. We want to provide uh, the best user experience possible. Uh, so you, you're not required to have MetaMask, and you can actually uh, participate in the NFT drops using a credit card. So we, we want to access these mainstream consumers for these NFT drops. So that's built on different technology. Uh, but the NFTs are minted on Ethereum. We're using the, uh, the, the both of the popular NFT standards on Ethereum for, the, for that product. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and now when you look at Origin Protocol with the different sections, DeFi, NFTs, what's the current status since you launched this? Uh, how big is it? How many users? What can you tell us? So uh, we've, both of these products are, are pretty new for us. Uh, we launched Origin Dollar in, uh, uh, in no November of 2020. And it's grown quite uh, significantly, quite quickly. Uh, in January of this, late January of this year, I think the TVL or the circulating market cap was around $4 million. Uh, now it's up to over $18 million. So it's grown quite a bit. Um, the NFT launchpad is even newer. Uh, our first uh, NFT drop was with Blau, spelled three Lau. He's a very, very well-known DJ who's also a big crypto influencer. And the primary sale of his NFTs on Origin was, uh, it reached nearly $12 million. So that was the record at the time. Okay. C can you tell us a little bit more about these uh, NFT drops? So um, when did you start it and what are the highlights uh, currently out there? Uh, we started earlier uh, earlier this year, and Blau was the first one. I believe that was in February of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, we've also done Grammy award-winning musicians such as Lupe Fiasco, uh, Ryan Tedder from One Republic did his drop with us. We did uh, a drop with Mike Dean and Shepard Ferry. Shepard Ferry is the guy behind the Obey uh, iconic sh street art and uh, turned into a clothing line. And he's also the guy behind the uh, Barack Obama Hope posters from uh, 2008. And we've also done a Jake Paul drop. Uh, it was a boxing-themed NFT drop for his fight uh, with Ben Askren, which he won via a spectacular knockout. So there was also an NFT of you know the, the knockout moment. Uh, so we did an auction for that as well. Yeah. And we've got you know a. We've got a, a large number of NFT drops slated. Um, there, there's almost too many to keep track of. Okay, that sounds ex exciting. I think with all the NFT hype and the platform you've built out, um, you're you're in a good position. Let's. You mentioned a couple of your products. Let's break it down step by step for the audience. So, um, let's start with the first one. So you have the the OGN token. What, how would you describe what is the token? What are the functionalities? So OGN is the platform and governance token for all of Origin's products. Um, on the Origin dollar or OUSD side, uh, it's going to be used directly to vote for uh, protocol changes on Origin dollar. Like uh, it could be used to vote on new strategies, uh, allocation, uh, allocation amounts to different strategies. Um, you know, what's done with any sort of performance fee or service fee, uh, you know, where is that diverted? What is it used for? Uh, so pretty standard, you know, DeFi governance token uh, on the origin dollar front. Mm -hmm. um, for the NFT launchpad, we're still working on the, the best kind of token economics for that. You know, token economics is always an evolving field. People think they have, you know, the best model figured out. 
and then it just keeps changing and changing. So we want to be adaptable. Yeah. So we're still figuring out uh, the best uh, OGN tie-in for the NFT drops. Okay. And now, like you already mentioned, this, the second key part, the origin dollar. What is the origin dollar um, and what, what are the benefits for the community? So origin dollar or, or OUSD is a way to get exposure to all the best yields in DeFi, but in a completely passive manner. So right now, if you want to deploy your stable coins and do yield farming on DeFi, you're going to have to do a lot of separate transactions using MetaMask probably. You're going to pay a lot of gas fees. You're going to have to rotate your crops, as they call it, constantly to search out for the best yields. You'll have to manually uh, withdraw and liquidate your, your yield. Uh, it, it's a very, very time consuming, uh, expensive because of Ethereum gas fees. And it's, it's a process that takes a lot of knowledge and you know, it can be very risky. Uh, mm -hmm. So Origin Dollar is a product where all of that is taken care of for you. So Origin Dollar is actually a stable coin uh, that rebases positively, meaning that uh, the supply that's in your wallet is always going to go up over time. So say you start out with 1,000 uh, OUSD or Origin Dollars in your wallet. As, as we do yield farming on your behalf, your balance is going to go up over time. So mm -hmm. it's a completely passive way to yield farm. You just get more origin dollars in your wallet over time. And and is the origin dollar uh, fully backed with with dollar, or what's the mechanism uh, there behind? It's fully backed by a basket of three stable coins: USDT, USDC, and Dai. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. And then um, when I look at your website, there's also the D shop. So um, yeah, what is the D-Shop? How would you explain this? So D-Shop is kind of like a decentralized Shopify. It's an e-commerce platform where you can create your own decentralized storefront and you can accept cryptocurrencies for your goods or services that you list, or you can uh, do a traditional payment system like uh, Stripe credit card integrations or PayPal. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And um, so then with D-Shop um, being the Shopify, uh, the Shopify comparison, what's your vision on that? Will you be as big or bigger as Shopify in a, in a couple of years? I mean, hopefully, but you know, one of the decisions that went into going uh, full steam ahead with NFTs was that we wanted to target a segment that crypto users are already familiar with and already excited about. One of the, I guess, hurdles or, or challenges that I think a lot of crypto projects have to deal with is that, you know, the user experience for using decentralized applications or dApps or using crypto at all is, you know, it it's, can be pretty difficult for someone who's not used to it. So mm -hmm. we decided to put our D-Shop focus more on NFTs because we saw that as a something that people in crypto are getting really, really excited about now. Uh, it's great to be able to buy, you know, t-shirts or books or whatever using crypto uh, on these decentralized storefronts. But what can we offer that's not available on, on a, a Shopify storefront or an Amazon? And the answer to that is NFTs. And that's really exciting. Okay. And, and then the last key element, if I'm correct on the product ecosystem of Origin Protocol, um, is the Origin Marketplace. How would you describe the Origin Marketplace? So the Origin Marketplace is uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for goods and services. It's completely decentralized. It lives on the Ethereum blockchain. All of the metadata is hosted on IPFS. Um, we established that in 2018, and we've since uh, kind of given up control of it to the community. The community is still able to use it. Uh, as with everything on Ethereum, like once it's on there, it's there forever. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that's still running on Ethereum. Anyone can create a listing. Uh, anyone can buy and, buy and sell using these smart contracts. OK. And, and that also had been recently featured on the Samsung blockchain. Uh, what, is, what is that about? Is that a deeper partnership with, with Samsung or? 
Yeah, so Samsung wanted to feature some decentralized applications uh, on this thing called Blockchain Key Store, and they had a kind of a DAP marketplace. And our origin marketplace, our mobile application, was one of the featured uh, applications on their marketplace. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So I think what would be also interesting uh, would be to learn a little bit about the company itself. So uh, it's originally like it's it's a US based company uh, or like San Francisco team based. Maybe you can explain what's the team, who are the, who are the key founders, uh, who are the investors, who's behind Origin Protocol. Sure. Yeah, we were originally based in San Francisco, but due to COVID, like a lot of other tech companies, we've gone fully decentralized, fully remote. Mm -hmm. uh, we have team members all over the world now. Uh, a lot of team members in Asia, a lot of team members in the US, some in Europe, uh, some in Australia, pretty much everywhere. Uh, and a little bit of history, we were founded in 2017 in San Francisco. Uh, the, the two co-founders are uh, successful entrepreneurs, they've started multiple uh, companies together. You know, they've founded venture-backed startups before. Uh, one of them, Matthew Liu, he was one of the first uh, product managers at YouTube, and you know that obviously that got acquired by Google. You know, he's had a long, successful career in Silicon Valley. Uh, he's got bachelor's and master's from Stanford, so all the Silicon Valley pedigree. Uh, Josh Josh Fraser is the other co-founder. Um, he's, you know, uh, another pretty uh, typical background for a uh, successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur, started coding when he was very, very young. Uh, I, I guess the most notable company he started was Torbit, which is a web optimization company. He sold that to Walmart Labs, so successful exit for him. He's been involved in crypto for a long time. Matthew's been involved in crypto for a long time. So uh, they were really excited to start Origin together and you know, build something in this exciting new industry. And, and then the founding engineer of Origin Protocol, he's a legend in the uh, startup technology space. His name is Yupan. You can look, look him up on Wikipedia. He was one of the original co-founders of PayPal alongside Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, et cetera. And he was also the first employee at YouTube. So, you know, that kind of speaks for itself. So we are very lucky to have him as the founding engineer of Origin. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. Yeah. So it's really kind of a silic Silicon Valley uh, group with lots of experience in developing successful companies. So that uh, gives kind of credibility to Origin Protocol, obviously, right at start. And now... Um, Give us some insights about how this all came together. There's the Jake Paul boxing NFT. Can you share the story? Like, did you call Jake Paul or like, how did that all happen? And then what had been offered as an NFT uh, at your platform? So the first NFT drop we did was with Blau. The I mentioned him earlier. He's a very successful DJ and music producer and also... You know, a very notable crypto investor and influencer himself. Uh, so that was a very, very big success for us. And that made headlines in a lot of mainstream press. It was even in the New York Times. So until Beeple did his $70 million uh, every day's uh, auction, uh, the Blau drop with Origin was the record holder for you know the highest, highest uh, primary sale in, mm -hmm. in NFT history. It was nearly $12 million. So after that happened, we had thousands and thousands of people contacting us uh, asking to do their NFT drops with us. And for Jake Paul, uh, he, he started a venture fund himself called the Anti Fund. And his partner in that is, his name is Jeffrey Wu. And he's actually a friend of mine and a friend of uh, our founders. Uh, they were investors in origin. So th that's how we got connected. So it happened to be that Jake's new uh, partner for his venture fund it was also an investor in Origin, so someone we previously knew. Okay, exciting. Yeah, and then what did you offer them with Jake Paul's NFTs? So we did two things. There was an auction and there were open editions. So mm -hmm. for those who don't know, open editions are NFTs that are on sale for a limited period of time. So maybe one hour or something. Uh, you can buy as many as you can get and then they're done. 
that those are the ones that are minted and, and that's the scarcity uh, that they're set for forever. Uh, so we did uh, five open editions with him. Uh, they were all partnerships with various artists uh, and there are different unique tie-ins for each one. One of them was tied to a limited edition sneaker drop where he worked with uh, an established sneakerhead studio uh, and, and the NFT was redeemable for these limited edition sneakers. And then the auction uh, had 69 uh, winning bidders and they were tiered in different formats. So the top bidder got uh, different rewards and in-person experiences than the uh, maybe the, the second tier and then the third tier. Uh, there were, that, that's one of the interesting things about these NFTs. NFT auctions, you can design so many different tie-ins, so many different unique experiences. The NFTs can be redeemable for in-person experiences. They can be used to unlock exclusive digital content. You know, it, the the sky's the limit with them. It's really up to you know, your imagination how, how yeah. you can use these different NFTs. And, and I see that you also have been now exploring um, different new categories for NFTs. So there's also this Grammy Award winning musician who now dropped the NFTs there. Can you tell us what are you doing there? Is the is the music part of the NFT or, or what's uh, like what are the or innovations over there? So we've done a, a number of different things with different uh, musicians for Blau. Um, we tokenized uh, his his Ultraviolet album, which was one of his previous albums he released. Mm -hmm. So we tokenized that album, and we also uh, tokenized some unreleased versions of tracks on that album. And that was something I think fit very well with NFTs because NFTs derive some of their value from being scarce. So doing things like limited edition songs or or uh, uh, previously unheard demo versions or remixes. Uh, that's one of the things that we're doing with music NFTs specifically. Um, for Lupe Fiasco, we used NFTs as a access token for a, an exclusive uh, live concert experience. So th that's another thing we've done with uh, music and NFTs. So it, it can be both. It can be uh, tokenized music. Uh, it can be new music, previously unheard remixes. It can be old music. Uh, there can be a combination of visual art and music, which is what we did with uh, Mike Dean and Shepard Ferry. Uh, there was music plus uh, Shepard Ferry's uh, visual artwork. Um, it, like I said before, the possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. And um, so with summarizing all of this like NFT work, you mentioned that there is this <laughs> NFT launch pad. Um, and you also published a new light paper around it. What is the NFT launchpad now, um, and 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 what can people expect there? So the NFT launchpad is the technology platform we use to launch all of these NFT drops, and it's not uh, it's not com complete yet. We're building more features out all the time. Eventually, we want to have a fully featured NFT platform that has its whole ecosystem has its own ecosystem has a marketplace for secondary trading um, so I'm hesitant to define exactly what it is now because it's going to be a lot uh, more in the future mm -hmm. okay and talking about the, the future what is uh, how would you describe the roadmap of origin protocol what's up for this year and then um, the future ahead so right now, a lot of our engineering focuses on building these new features for our NFT platform. Like I said, we want to have a fully featured secondary marketplace. Um, we want to add a lot more different kinds of uh, use cases and experiences that are made possible by NFTs. Um, yeah, we want to be the best NFT platform, the most customizable NFT platform. Uh, you know, ones that, ones that the NFT platform that offers the most creative control to mm -hmm. artists and creators. Uh, that's our goal for this year on the NFT side. Okay. Now, on, on the OUSD or origin dollar side, we're looking to integrate as, with as many DeFi protocols and platforms as possible, and also to secure more centralized exchange listings for uh, origin dollar 
we, we just listed OUSD on KuCoin the other day, which was a major uh, milestone for us. Uh, we think that DeFi works best if everyone can have access to it. And, you know, and not, not everyone knows how to you know, use MetaMask or, or do uh, Ethereum transactions right now. So we think yeah. it's key to have uh, OUSD on as many centralized exchanges as possible. So now with the with the listing at L6 Exchange, uh, OGN is listed as one of the few regulated European-based exchanges. What's the important for f importance for you um, being listed at L6 Exchange? I think having a global presence is very very uh, beneficial for all crypto projects, and you know one of the key value propositions of what we're doing is that it's it gives everyone exposure to uh, not only uh, a stable coin that, you know, that obviously holds its value uh, because it's fully backed and, and it's based on, uh, you know, essentially US dollars, but also gives people uh, the best yields in DeFi. And we've seen, you know, maybe you don't feel that great about your uh, home country's currency. So you want to trade your euros for, uh, Origin dollars, you know, maybe maybe you feel better about the dollar, and you like the yields that you would get from holding OUSD. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, th I think it kind of speaks for itself. Where why would we want to have, you know, the, the whole world involved? Like, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So we are we excited to have. Uh, OGN token listed with two trading pairs. There's uh, OGN LCX token, and then there's OGN USDC. And we're actually the only USDC pair uh, globally. So that's something where um, we're excited about as well. Let's pick a question here from the audience. And just a reminder to everybody, you can uh, post your questions. The best way is go on YouTube. Um, post the questions there and then we can pick it right away. So there's, there's one question here from Ike. The OGN token has fluctuated between 10 cent and four, um, like, uh, yeah, 10 cent and 40 cent for a year. So what has changed to make the token increase in value so much? What kind of applications did you create that made it rise uh, or above $1? So I'm not going to comment too directly on price for obvious reasons. Um, right now, the OGN token is trading at above one dollar, so you know it's it's well above uh, forty cents. So I'm not I'm not quite sure what the commenter meant by that. Um, and what has caused it to increase in value so much? You know, I I think it's the market speaks for itself. I mean, people like quality projects. I think we have a, an awesome team, awesome products, and I think market participants are interested in that. I don't I don't want to comment. Too much further about uh, price related okay. questions, but but can you describe the OGN's incentive system because it's it's designed in, in a way that uh, it creates value within a closed loop system or something like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I can talk a little bit about it. So uh, part of the yield that's generated by Origin Dollar, the the uh, the back end yield farming processes. 10% of that is taken as a service fee, and that is used to programmatically buy back uh, OGN on the open market. So it's not something that we're doing, it's something that a smart contract is doing. And uh, OGN is also the governance token for Origin Dollar. So you know, even that is uh, up for change. So when decentralized governance is launched for Origin Dollar, OGN holders will be able to make key decisions like, do they want a buyback? Do they want to do something else with the service fee? Is the service fee too high? Is the service fee too low? So that you know, people might find that that having a, a stake in Origin Dollar and how how these decisions are being made, people might find that valuable. And now, like talking about all these these products. For Origin Protocol, um, who is your target org audience? Who are your customers and where do you want to grow more? So something that we are trying to target is mainstream users. We want to bring crypto mainstream. So we think NFTs are a great way to do that. You know, NFTs can touch every aspect of popular culture, especially with how, how quickly uh, culture and content is becoming digital 
Everything's internet first these days. Everything's becoming increasingly financialized. People like to trade memes. People like to trade everything these days. So we think NFTs are a great way to bring crypto mainstream. And we're definitely targeting mainstream users. We think that's obviously the biggest addressable market. And that's the market that we want to serve. And the same same thing for Origin Dollar. We made it. We wanted to create the easiest yield farming experience possible. And by holding Origin Dollar, you're yield farming without doing any of the yield farming uh, activities. You just hold the mm -hmm. token and you get all the benefits of yield farming. And we are eventually going to build uh, like mobile a mobile payments app that uses Origin Dollar as kind of the payment rail. Uh, so. The way we would uh, market that to a mainstream audience is, hey, you know, what's your high high yield savings account at your bank paying? You know, point something percent, you know, negative in real terms. With Origin Dollar, you'd get double digit yield uh, through exposure to DeFi. Uh, so we, we think that there's there's a lot of opportunity to bring this stuff mainstream. It's it's not just for diehard crypto people. Okay. And and talking about regions, you said you're a decentralized company, core team around Silicon Valley, but now spread out everywhere. You are in Asia. So where is your target audience in terms of uh, growth? Is that also driven by Asian clients, users, or US-based, or is it really Europe? I think it's all of the above. Uh, we want to target all of those markets. Uh, we do think, you know, it's, it's been a personal hypothesis of mine, and I think, you know, it's shared with Origin, the company, and among the entire industry, that there is a lot of demand for uh, stable coins, U.S. dollar-backed stable coins in non-U.S. markets. A lot of people would rather hold uh, USDC or, you know, perhaps Origin dollar, you know, which is backed by USDC and gives you yield. People would rather hold something like that than their native fiat currency because they, you know, they trust uh, crypto more. They trust the dollar more. You know, they want access to better yields. They don't want, you know, to be subject to the monetary policy in their own country. Mm. So, Absolutely. you know, if you live in a country where there's hyperinflation or uh, there's negative interest rates, it, it makes a lot of sense why you would want exposure to uh, a stable coin and DeFi yields. Okay. And now you're head of uh, business development globally at Origin Protocol. What's coming up? How, like, what are the biggest um, milestones for you ahead? Can you tell us a little bit about upcoming partnerships or developments planned? Uh, we've got a lot of upcoming partnerships planned. Uh, I can't pre-announce them. That's not something uh, we're in the habit of doing, but uh If you take a look at our, our Twitter or our medium, you can see some of the highlights uh, of this past year. Uh, we had a partnership with AWS that was very well received by our community and their community. They told us that was that our blog posts uh, about our integration with AWS was one of the highest engagement blog posts that, that, that they've had on their uh, AWS Marketplace blog. Mm -hmm. um, We also did a partnership with Google Cloud uh, that was also very, very well received. Um, and you mentioned the Samsung partnership. That was from a, a little while back. Uh, so we've got good relationships with a, lar a lot of large, iconic tech companies. And you know we're going to continue to try to work with uh, the best companies in, in all of technology. Okay, and then in, in terms of your timeline and, and business development, there is a question here from Abramo. Is there a timeline for all the beautiful things you're talking about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm beginning a sense of theme from some of these questions. I, I cannot provide a timeline on, uh, on these things. And, you know, uh, I can only say that we're working as hard as we can and we hope to announce many great things soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then in, in relation to that from No Lo Boto um, it may be too early, but since that is mentioned already uh, in your light paper and future products, could we have any anticipation or comments about the origin dollar, US dollar uh, debit card and mobile app? So I already touched on that a little bit. Like we are planning on building a Venmo or depending on where you're from, Alipay style mobile payments app that runs on OUSD. Uh, so it would 
provide the yields that OESC provides. And we're also planning on launching a debit card that is paired with that mobile application. So instead of getting you know one to two percent cash back or whatever on your purchases, you get access to these DeFi yields uh, instead of cash back, which would be probably much more attractive. You get these yields whether you're spending or not. Um, mm -hmm. As far and, as and time, the app will be um, US centric or global, and and like how do you want to roll this out as a as a global like payments offering, or, or will it be limited to certain countries? So there are a lot of complications when you're trying to release you know, a fintech product like this. There's, there's a lot of regulations, uh, a lot of licenses, a lot of things like that. So I don't want to commit or comment on exactly how the rollout's going to take mm -hmm. place, when it's going to take place, you know, which markets we're going to launch in. Um, I would say look for announcements uh, for that later this year, possibly. Okay. And then like looking at the business model of Origin Protocol, you did these drops of NFTs. And of course, for any successful company, revenues are important. So what are your revenue streams and the, the business model around it? So we do take uh, a portion of some of the, the sales uh, revenue from these NFT drops. And uh, that is used to uh, buy back OGN on the open market. Um, but the, I think that, um, you know, we're a cryptocurrency company. We're a company that has a token. So I think uh, we're primarily focused on how to deliver uh, value to various, uh, uh, I guess, I, I, want, I want to word this carefully, various stakeholders in, in the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, there, I, I think it's a limiting thing to think of only revenues, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain offers so many more possibilities than just, you know, sales revenues and things like this. And you also mentioned that there are a couple of uh, exchange listings now with the OGN token, but there is a question in regards to the origin US dollar from Adrian. Have any exchanges also expressed interest in listing origin US dollar or um, are you planning that already with all the exchanges now or what's the status there? So I mentioned earlier that uh, KuCoin just listed uh, origin dollar OUSD. So mm -hmm. that's a major uh, centralized exchange you know, with a lot of altcoin traders, a, a very, very robust community. So they've recently listed OUSD. Another exchange uh, called Virgo X based in Canada listed uh, OUSD several months back. So those are two uh, centralized exchange listings for OUSD, uh, you know, on top of Uniswap, SushiSwap, et cetera. So, and then now if you look at the kind of key highlights of uh, origin dollar, what are your expectations then? Will this compete with stable coins or has it like a broader um, kind of business model in mind? It has the potential to do a lot of different things. You know, it does have that potential of competing as a stable coin, as a currency of quote, even for exchanges. You know, it, would you rather trade your Bitcoin on a, US, uh, a USDT, a tether market, or would you rather trade it on a market with a stable coin that gets you yield uh, passively? So, you know, if you're holding OUSD, you know, you're waiting to enter a Bitcoin position, you're going to get yield while you're waiting to, you know, for the perfect entry for your uh, BTC order. So, you know, that we do want to compete as a as a currency that's used for quoting markets. So kind of like a competitor to, a competitor to USDT in that respect. Uh, we also want to compete as a um, as a currency. We want people to use OUSD do, when they're doing commerce, you know, when they're buying and selling things online. Uh, it would be great if you were a small business owner, if your cash reserves uh, generated yield, you know, the, the, there's really endless possibilities. Like when you are trying to create a better form of money uh, that gives people access to passive yields, uh, I think there's many, many applications for it. And then you, you already mentioned and I already mentioned the mobile payments uh, application 
aspect of Origin Dollar. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think we want to compete as a currency for quote on exchanges. We want to compete as a medium of exchange for business. We want to compete uh, with you know high yield savings accounts. We want to compete with Venmo. We want to compete you know with anything dollar related. We want to compete. Okay, that that's very ambitious, yeah, and of obviously a huge, huge potential for Origin Protocol itself. And now, like talking about um, how do you actually make that happen? So, what are the key steps now, um, rolling it out to reach that um, th that goal? What are um, yeah, what are you like immediately uh, uh, kind of growth plans there? Well, you said it. We want to we want to grow Origin Dollar, and that means growing the. You, know, you can look at it as TVL, or you can look at it look at it as circulating supply. We want the market cap of Origin Dollar OUSD to be much much larger than it is now. And how do we do that? We need to give people more access to it. We need to communicate the value proposition to it to to new markets. So centralized exchange listings, further integration with other DeFi platforms. Um, perhaps giving uh, giving users who are not traditionally or typically interested in crypto uh, a reason to care about uh, crypto through Origin Dollar is, is another way we can grow Origin Dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, I already mentioned uh, marketing it as a high yield savings account instead of something crypto specific, I think could be very successful for us in the future. Okay, yeah, excellent. I think in terms of the the setup you have done with the with the proper team and the kind of global outreach you're already in in a in a good position of growth and uh, now um where do you see the the biggest uh, opportunities and and low hanging fruits is it on kind of mobile adoption or is it on this decentralized marketplace really revolutionizing um kind of how business had been done in the past so I'm not sure I would call it low-hanging fruit, but we think Origin Dollar has a ton of room to grow. We think it's a super compelling product. You know, who doesn't want to earn, you know, 10, 20, sometimes higher percent yields on passively holding cash? Uh, so we think Origin Dollar has a, a lot of room to grow. We also think NFTs are the future of digital content, the, the future of, you know, creative content. Yeah, there's so many, I, I don't want to put it in a box because there's so many potential use cases for NFTs. Yeah, there's probably going to be new use cases six months from now that we had not anticipated. People are going to think of amazing things to do with NFTs that mm -hmm. you know, would, would not have been possible if, these, uh, if NFTs weren't around. You, the fact that they, can, that they exist on decentralized blockchains, they can be traded, you can program things, things like royalties, or secondary market commissions back to the creator. There's so many different things you can do with them that I think NFTs are the future of content, the future of entertainment. You know, perhaps the future of uh, gaming. There's so many. There's so much potential for NFTs. Mm -hmm. That that's a good quote. You you're saying NFTs are the future of social content and probably uh, the emergence or next level of social media i still remember the times when we had been talking about um citizen journalism the first blogs being launched the first social media platform friends or myspace and then facebook came came along and but now we are actually having a technology and underlying framework r really in innovated the market space one particular key part of that is if if your thesis is right, that NFTs are the future of social, what role does a decentralized marketplace play and what is a decentralized marketplace in your perspective? So I think having a marketplace for NFTs is extremely important. Um, you know, it's one thing to demonstrate the value of an NFT, you know, that might represent content, might represent an in-person experience, it might, might represent access to something, uh, it's one thing to to put a price on it from the primary sale, but having a marketplace where you can continue to trade that, uh, it's very very important for price discovery. You know, you, you, how do you know what an NFT is worth if 
you know, just because you bought it for $10 doesn't mean it's worth $10 until you can sell it to someone else for $10. So, so having a marketplace, extremely important for price discovery. And it's also very important to the creators because you can program in now that any subsequent trades with that NFT, a portion of that can go back to the creator. So it, it can create a sustainable uh, revenue stream for creators that you know maybe they, they didn't have access to before or they didn't have as much control over before. So if you're a content creator, you know, have, having a secondary marketplace, having trades and having some of that value go back to you, it's very, very important. And it, it completely changes, you know, the, things like the music industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think royalty fees and then also kind of profiting for artists along the way um, is fascinating. And I think what's, what's important to understand here and to point out is Of course, there had been fees involved in a centralized marketplace already. So if you buy something on eBay, then eBay will earn a little fee and then the, the seller obviously earns something. But you're putting that on a blockchain, meaning it's fully decentralized, even if it's outside of your ecosystem, the because it's part of the smart contract, these fees are generated. Um, What's your take in, in terms of the, your ecosystem strategy and the platform strategy? Does everything need to happen on your platform or is it already going beyond that? No, I, I think it's better if there's, you know, if things are totally open and can be transferred from one platform to the platform of your choice. You know, that, that's the whole premise of NFTs. If NFTs were locked to a particular marketplace or a, a particular platform, I, I think they wouldn't have as much value as they do. Uh, mm -hmm. NFTs are meant to be freely transferable. You can, if you don't like the origin NFT ecosystem, you can take your NFT to OpenSea. You can take it to any other NFT platform, and that's that's the way it should be. And yes. you know, we're building on these standards for a reason to allow this free uh, transferability. Mm -hmm. Two two questions in regards to your recent project. So from Mario Gomez. How is Paris Hilton related to Origin? And uh, in relation to that um, from Dalal, how is re really Paris Hilton associated with OGN? So she's a friend of the project. Uh, she's been su supporting us with various tweets. Uh, our two co-founders are close with her and her team. Uh, so yeah, she's a, she's a fan of the project. We, we appreciate her support. Okay, but there's nothing concrete yet. So yeah, I'm 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 not able to pre-announce anything on the show, unfortunately. And then uh, another token-related questions um, here: the board members are still holding OGN coins, as Josh posted on Twitter. Is it still true? Uh, yeah, as far as I know. Uh, Matt and Josh, the co-founders of Origin, have not sold a single token, uh, and they've made a public pledge not to do so. Mm -hmm. You know, they actually signed new uh, four-year vesting schedules when they had already vested over half of their uh, team tokens, uh, just to signal their commitment to the community that you know, this is something very, very long-term focused for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And they believe in the future of OGN. So they haven't sold OGN, and they voluntarily locked themselves Uh, for another four years uh, when, when OGN was listed on Binance. Mm -hmm. Originally, Origin was founded in 2017. Uh, OGN listed on Binance in January 2020. So over two years of their four-year schedule had, had already elapsed. So they had access to over half of the, their founder tokens, but they said, no, we don't need access to it. And just to signal to the community that we uh, really care about the long term term prospects of OGN, we're going to sign a new four-year vesting schedule that starts uh, today. So yeah, that's something that you don't see a lot from crypto projects, but it's something that they were happy to do. Yeah. What's the role of regulation and compliance for OGN and then also for Origin Protocol as a whole? Uh, we aim to be as compliant as possible. Uh, we, we respect all the regulations, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, exactly what the question is getting at, but, you know, we are fully compliant and 
you know, regulation, it can be a, it can be a necessary thing for, for the crypto industry. Okay. Okay. Um, then, you know, I'm, I'm always asking this question because we invest in a lot, uh, in, in regulation, um, as a, as a fully regulated compliant exchange out of Liechtenstein in Europe, I see regulation as an, an enabling, uh, and also a growth factor for the future, especially if we look at mass adoption, because at the moment, the kind of mass adoption is still ahead of us. We already see a lot of growth happening, but it, it's still the early days with uh, probably 100 million active users now in crypto. Imagine like being in the internet, talking about the internet with 100 million users. There will be still a big, big growth coming ahead of us. And I believe that this will only work if we work together with the regulators. Um, and um, yeah, I had been impressed around the, the Asian uh, regulation going forward about central banks over there, about uh, uh, governance, embracing it. But especially in Europe, I think Liechtenstein stands out because it um, came up with the most forward-looking regulatory uh, framework. And we are trying to embrace that as, as far as we can on our own platform. Let's take another question here. Um, so... Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, there are a lot of questions coming in in regards to Paris now, <laughs> but uh, that's a good one here. Who do you see the biggest competitors in the space? Um, if there are any major ones, like who do you compete with? I would say on the NFT front, uh, OpenSea, Nifty Gateway, uh, they're doing a lot of great work. Uh, they're doing a lot of NFT drops. They've got a uh, you know, pretty good ecosystem, pretty good platform. Uh, on the origin dollar front, uh, there are other projects that are doing yield aggregation, but I think mm -hmm. what they they're offering is quite different than us. So if you look at urine.finance, you, you can put your stable coins in a urine vault and earn uh, earned yield passively. Uh, but the mechanics of it are, are a little bit different on, when it comes to, you know, the direct user experience. You're not holding, you know, a urine stable coin, you're holding your involved tokens. And if you want to access your yield, you, you're going to have to exit the vault. Uh, with origin dollar, it's quite, it's, it's quite different than most of the yield aggregators because the yield is distributed automatically. Uh, you just get more origin dollar tokens in your wallet over time. You mm -hmm. don't have to withdraw. You don't have to pay uh, any sort of ex exit fee. You don't have to unstake or liquidate anything. You just get more tokens over time. Okay, and then, but also if you would look at the traditional marketplace, do you see any competitors outside of the typical crypto markets? Like where will the like new users come from if you want to attract mass adoption? Um, well, I mean, I think anyone who has a bank account, anyone who holds dollars, you know, they're a potential DeFi customer. They're a potential user of Origin Dollar. Uh, like I said earlier, why would you take 0.5% interest rates on your dollar deposits when you can get 20% uh, via origin dollar or, you know, using a competitor, another uh, yield farming product? Okay. And um, so now looking at, um, at Origin's uh, core team what gets you most excited about um if you look at the competencies and and now like adding i mean making growth on, on the user side that's something we talked about but how do you grow and scale the company itself that's a good question um we try to balance things uh by taking the best of both worlds we have a lot of silicon valley uh, iconic tech company experience at origin, uh, but we also have a lot of crypto native experience. A, a lot of us, a lot of us, have been in crypto for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are, we'll hire people from you know the best companies like Google or Dropbox or, or PayPal or whatever, and go through a traditional hiring process with them. Uh, but we'll also hire from the open source community. We've hired several developers who. Our first interaction with was them submitting a pull request on GitHub because all of our code is open source. Anyone can comment on it. Anyone can view it. Anyone can, you know, suggest a change to it. 
So we've actually hired quite a few people uh, based on this kind of open source activity. They're, they can join our Discord, they can start asking us questions, they can start contributing to our code base. So we've hired people based on that as well. And you know, crypto community is, is an awesome thing, and it's a unique thing, and we look to tap into that as much as possible. We, we don't want to restrict ourselves just hiring you know, people outside of crypto, it's traditional tech and finance background people. We want to hire crypto natives too. And now, like being so decentralized, I think the, the over hiring part will be a key success factor for you to grow. And of course, uh, the crypto space is very competitive in terms of finding the right engineers, the right team. What else do you do within the team now to get everybody up to speed in terms of your internal communication and then also educational? Like if you develop something, how to um, do that on a decentralized manner? Um, so we have weekly meetings that, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's a, it's a tough thing to try to schedule every, all the different time zones, but, uh, right. you know, our, our team members are flexible and they're willing to work, uh, to have at least, you know, one or two weekly meetings where maybe it's not the most convenient time for them, but it's what will work for everybody. Mm -hmm. So we'll have weekly meetings. We'll have daily meetings. We do a lot of our communication on discord. Uh, so. It can be asynchronously or it can be, you know, live chat on Discord. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and this is not something unique to crypto. It's not something unique uh, to technology companies. This is something, unfortunately, the entire world has, ha has had to learn in the last yep. two years. So, you know, people are developing new tools, new best practices for this, and, you know, we're learning as we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I think education is, is a key part of that as well. Because obviously you can learn from each other a lot, but also um, kind of educating the or your users, your team, um, kind of your investors, uh, what you're doing as we are emerging into this new space of DeFi and NFTs. Um, like personally, there, there's a question here from Eike coming in. Do you have any role models in the crypto space or I would say even outside? And if so, why? So I really look up to the origin founding team. So I'll, I'll give an answer outside of it. I don't want to give a cop-out answer, but I really look up to Matt and Josh. They're amazing entrepreneurs. I really look up to Yupan, our founding engineer. You know, he's a legend in the space. Like I said, you can you can see his Wikipedia page if, if you don't trust me. Um, I would say outside of origin, um, you know, someone I look up to is, you know, CZ from Binance. He's done a really amazing job at building out an amazing, you know, force of nature company in a very, very short period of time. Uh, I look up to SBF, Sam from FTX and Alameda. Uh, I especially look up to him because of his focus on effective altruism. That was a community that I was uh, part of, you know, many years ago. You know, I, I'm really into those ideas. You know, I was part of the, the rationalist community as well. So part of his motivation for building these awesome, huge, successful companies is to make a lot of money, but to make a lot of money for philanthropy. So, you know, I think it's awesome what he's doing, uh, donating 1% of uh, the, the profits from fees to charity and, you know, pledging to donate much more in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see the, the kind of future altruistic uh, view on like building a company and success is, is something dear to your heart. But now I want to get your three key trends as we're wrapping up this session. So what are the key three trends for the industry and for Origin Protocol um, which drive the business? So I, uh, two of the trends are something that we're actively working on. NFTs, you know, obviously a huge trend in crypto. NFTs have brought mainstream attention and this kind of cultural cachet to crypto that crypto hasn't had in you know previous cycles. You know, in 2017, 2018, if you remember, crypto was beginning to become somewhat mainstream, but it was only talked about as a speculative thing, a thing that traders were doing. But with NFTs, you get all of culture, you get all of content. So it it makes it much, much bigger and much more inclusive. So NFTs are a big trend. Mm -hmm. um, DeFi, you know. Starting from, you know, two, three years ago, uh, I started to see rumblings of 
people I know in Southeast Asia, you know, they, they decided to shut down their bank accounts or not use their fiat currency anymore. And they start to bank themselves using, yeah. you know, USDC, USDT and, and various, you know, compound or whatever DeFi lending protocols. Um, and I wasn't surprised to see that exploded because it's a, it's a perfect use case for crypto. It's a, you know, crypto offers a superior form of money and it makes sense that it should have a superior financial system to go with it. So I think DeFi is uh, prime for even more explosive growth. Uh, and then the third trend, um, let's see, what, what would be the third trend? I think, you know, there's there's going to be a lot more institutional interest. We've already begun to see, see that. Uh, you know, when you have people, you know, at the Federal Reserve or, you know, in various government offices commenting directly on Ethereum and directly on DeFi, they're not just talking about Bitcoin as uh, potential digital gold or reserve asset, but they're talking about specific DeFi protocols. I, I think that means that institutions are taking this stuff a lot more seriously. It's not just, you know, an alternative speculative asset. They're, they're actually looking at it uh, at, the, at the actual use case and the actual potential of applications built on blockchains instead of just uh, the speculative aspect. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to continue. Okay, good, good points. So I, just to summarize your key top three trends, you mentioned NFTs with all the possibilities there are non-fungible tokens. You mentioned the second point, DeFi with um, banking, finance, and uh, banking yourself, and then also all the innovation which comes with DeFi. And the third point, you mentioned the institutional growth and adoption really bring it to the next level. Coleman, this was exciting. Thanks for sharing these insights beyond trading crypto use cases with Origin Protocol. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us this evening here from, from your Asian time zone and then onwards and upwards. It was great to talk to all of you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on, on Twitter, search for me. Uh, I'll be happy to respond to you. And if you want to keep up with Origin, uh, you can follow us on Twitter or, or check out our website. Perfect. Thanks, Coleman. Bye-bye. See you. This is LCX Insights Live. For more insights, please visit lcx.com forward slash insights and follow us on Twitter at LCX.